So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ryan Corcoran uh, from Mass General. He's the director of the Phase One program in the GI Oncology Unit there, uh, a prolific researcher. He's going to give us, uh, a, 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 he's going to educate us about the value of liquid biopsies. Uh, a lot of patients in our, in our practice, over 50%, don't really have enough tissue. Uh, the biopsies are in, inadequate for uh, next generation sequencing. So this, I believe, is a future liquid biopsies or blood tests for sequencing. Um, so please welcome Ryan. Thank you. So good morning, uh, and thank you uh, so much to everyone for having me here today. Um, it's my pleasure uh, uh, to be here, and I'm going to talk today about liquid biopsy and specifically focus on uh, potential emerging clinical applications uh, for patients with biliary tract cancers. So these are my uh, disclosures. So many of us have heard of liquid biopsy, and, and perhaps some of, us, some of us have not, but I think a good thing to start is, is what is a liquid biopsy? And in its broadest sense, liquid biopsy refers to um, detection and analysis of tumor-derived material from a body fluid. And that's really what I think has led to some of the excitement around liquid biopsy because typically these body fluids are, are, can be accessed by minimal invasive means or certainly through less invasive means than a standard surgical or interventional biopsy. But while most of us think of, um, of liquid biopsy as a, a blood test, it's actually important to know that there are actually some very interesting applications in a variety of other uh, uh, body fluids, saliva, urine, uh, even bile, uh, that, that really uh, in the right setting and the right cancer type may be uh, uh, quite uh, beneficial. So since most liquid biopsies, at least right now, uh, do involve analysis uh, of blood, um, I want to focus on, on some of the different uh, tumor materials that we, we do look at. Um, the first are actually circulating tumor cells. These are intact um, uh, tumor cells that actually extravasate from the tumor into the bloodstream. And using specialized uh, devices, uh, you can actually isolate uh, these cells, uh, profile these cells, and in many cases actually uh, derive uh, personalized tumor models, either in, uh, on a plastic dish or in a mouse of a patient's tumor. And so this is a very exciting emerging technology. Um, exosomes involve a um, uh, kind of an intermediate uh, where these are small membrane-bound bound vesicles that, that contain a number of different tumor uh, cell-derived materials, including protein, RNA, um, and, uh, and metabolites, and these, this is actually a very interesting emerging technology. But what I think has really um, uh, been the most uh, widespread use of liquid biopsy and, and really what has, has actually already made its way into clinical practice involves cell-free DNA. And these are fragments of, uh, of DNA that are actually shed from tumor cells into the bloodstream. And they can be isolated from the cell-free portion of a blood tube, the same way, uh, just a blood tube collected in the same way that a patient might have their routine labs drawn uh, at a, a regular clinic visit. And so the power to actually look inside and actually recreate the tumor genome um, uh, from a simple blood draw is certainly something that's uh, quite exciting. So I want to take a second, and, and uh, we, we hear the terms circulating tumor DNA and cell-free DNA a lot, and they actually refer to different things. So cell-free DNA is actually shed in the bloodstream both by, nor by normal cells and potentially by cancer cells. And so um, everybody has cell-free DNA in their bloodstream. Uh, for patients without cancer, that's all derived from normal organs, mostly the bone marrow. Um, and cancer patients, some component of that cell-free DNA is actually tumor-derived, and that component is what we refer to as circulating tumor DNA. So sometimes in a cancer patient, only a fraction, and sometimes even a very small fraction, of overall cell-free DNA is actually circulating tumor DNA. And this can be uh, range anywhere from 50% or more to as little as maybe um, a, a, a tenth or a hundredth of a percent. So one tumor-derived molecule emits a background of 10 a uh, thousand or more normal uh, uh, DNA molecules. And this is what really creates uh, an incredible technologic challenge. And there's been a, a great number of, of, uh, of innovators in this field that have really pushed this technology forward. Um, but if you can imagine trying to differentiate one tumor molecule and analyze that in a background of a thousand or 10,000 uh, normal uh, DNA molecules is quite challenging. Nevertheless, we have a whole range of approaches going anywhere from, from whole genome or whole exome sequencing, where we're looking at the entire genome or all the, all the, the actual genes in the genome, 
Um, this is a little more limited in sensitivity. We, we typically need patients to have a higher percentage of circulating tumor DNA present in the blood to do this. But we now have other methods like targeted sequencing or digital PCR that can detect um, you know, one uh, 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 mutated uh, tumor DNA molecule amidst uh, 10,000 10, or 100,000 uh, normal DNA molecules. And th this range of technologies is really what's driving this field. So what I want to do today is to, to spend just a tiny bit of time on some of the exciting uh, and emerging clinical um, uh, applications of this approach. And really the holy grail, which I, I won't talk about that today, is that, that liquid biopsy may actually provide us a way in a healthy and otherwise asymptomatic patient to actually detect the presence of cancer DNA and hence the presence of a growing and emerging cancer well before it could ever be detected clinically. And this would actually I, I do obviously change the way we approach cancer and perhaps turn this into something that could be intervened and treated at a very early stage. Of course, um, we, we also would like to just be able to detect these cancers at a time when they are, are actually intervenable clinically so that, that we can actually increase the cure rate and, and, and avoid picking these tumors up when they're too late. However, once a patient is diagnosed, there are actually a number of other applications. Uh, really, the only way we cure solid tumors is by resecting every tumor cell in the patient's body. And a very exciting technique, which we'll get back to at the end of the talk, is actually to use um, uh, the det uh, circulating tumor DNA detection about a month after an operation to see if any traces of, of, of CTDNA can be detected in a patient. And that's indicative of that patient has cancer cells somewhere in their body that still need to be treated in order to salvage cure. And this is really, I think, going to be one of the most exciting uh, areas of liquid biopsy going forward. Something that we've heard a little bit about already and uh, that, that we're, we're familiar with is once a patient is diagnosed with metastatic disease, um, particularly in a, in a disease like cholangiocarcinoma, where as Dr. Javelin mentioned, there's often inadequate tissue to, to profile extensively. Now from a blood test, we often are able to get um, a, a very similar range of information that we need uh, to actually identify targetable mutations and select therapy. Once a patient starts on therapy, we can actually look within a patient uh, at the change in the overall level of tumor DNA to, to decide sometimes at a very early point if that patient is responding or not. And then when, unfortunately, when a patient progresses on a therapy, we can now use this to reprofile the tumor genome, see how the tumor has evolved, and ideally select uh, subsequent therapies that can overcome that mechanism of resistance. So what I'll focus on are just these, uh, these three specific technologies as much as possible, emphasizing what's happening in the biliary uh, cancer space. The first is predicting treatment response. The second will be monitoring therapeutic resistance. And finally, detection of residual disease post-surgery. So um, this is uh, work done by, uh, mainly by Aparna Parikh, a junior faculty member in our group, and Jamie Schneider, one of our oncology fellows. And what we're looking at here is drawing blood from a patient before they start uh, a metastatic therapy, and again about four weeks after, after, the, after receiving that therapy. And this is actually about 90 patients across all GI cancers, but about 10 to 15 percent of these uh, patients are, all, are biliary cancers. And what we see here is by just looking at the drop in circulating tumor DNA in this first few weeks, we can actually very accurately predict which patients uh, 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 will have a, a partial response, or PR, shown in pink, relative to those who will have disease stability or a progression of disease. And actually, when you compare this to the standard tumor markers like CA99 or CEA that we use, um, this dramatically outperforms um, uh, 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 the ability of tumor markers, which actually cannot statistically significant, uh, cannot predict response in a statistically significant manner in this cohort. Um, moving on to, to therapeutic resistance, well, unfortunately, while we have many exciting emerging therapies, one of the biggest challenges we face is that even after very striking responses, almost all patients, whether it's uh, cytotoxic therapy, targeted therapy, or even immunotherapy, often move on to have a very rapid and, 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 um, and, uh, and, and robust recurrence of their tumor. And the way this, which this happens is that even though all of our tumor cells pictured here in green might have a specific target alteration, the target of, of perhaps that cancer drug, there's, uh, 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 there, there seems to be a pre-existing population of cells shown with a red hashing that have uh, some pre-existing mutation that renders them less sensitive to therapy. And these cells will unfortunately persist during therapy, be selected out under the, uh, the selective pressure of our treatment, and will ultimately populate the tumor with resistant disease. Now, if we could figure out what's driving resistance, we actually might be able to adapt or add therapy to overcome resistance. But unfortunately, it becomes even more complicated than that. And what we're learning more and more now is that within a patient's uh, tumor burden, we either can have different lesions within the patient's body or actually different tumor subclones within the same lesion that independently involved, uh, evolve different resistance mechanisms. And so while a standard single lesion tumor biopsy 
for example, a needle that goes just into the red part of one of, the, of many lesions might, give, might actually give us a very limited view of what's driving resistance throughout an individual patient. But since circulating tumor DNA is shed by tumor cells throughout the body, uh, by looking in the blood, we can perhaps get a more full catalog of what's present in the patient and adapt our therapies uh, to this and, and not miss something that, that might lead to treatment failure. And so in an effort to do this about four, almost five years ago now in the GI Cancer Center at MGH, we began to routinely, in addition to collecting pretreatment biopsies and post-progression biopsies to study resistant, we also uh, began collecting liquid biopsies at the start of treatment, at, at many time points throughout treatment, and again at progression. We were able to do this through an integrated disease center-wide protocol with a one-page consent brochure that patients received at their first visit. And it's fully staffed by clinical research coordinators and technicians so that a busy uh, a, a doc and clinic can, can uh, activate this uh, really within about 30 seconds. And uh, again, this is work from Aparna Parikh. What we found is that when we compare liquid biopsy to standard tumor biopsy at progression, we find uh, uh, several things. And one is that um, in, with liquid biopsy, we actually find a resistance mechanism more, uh, more cases than we do with standard tumor biopsy, about 75% of the time versus 48% of the time. But more importantly, with liquid biopsy, we, in almost half the cases, we find multiple resistance mechanisms in a given patient, ranging anywhere from two to as many as nine in this particular sample, where that rarely occurs with a single uh, tumor biopsy. And because of this, and this is, I think, a very staggering figure. 78% of the time, we're finding additional clinically relevant resistance mechanisms in the blood that are not present in, in a tumor biopsy obtained at the same time after progressing on treatment. And so this, I think, is really very strong evidence that we need to integrate liquid biopsy, at least in parallel with tumor biopsy, as we treat our patients and study how to improve our therapies. So I want to talk about some of the work that we're doing at MGH to really bring liquid biopsy into, uh, um, uh, into use for patient with, uh, patients with cholangiocarcinoma. Um, this is work done with our team, Lipa Gagoyal, uh, Andrew Zhu, uh, two of our, our, our clinical uh, colleagues, um, and Nabil Bardisi, our, uh, one of our laboratory scientists who focus on biliary cancer. And uh, I'll focus on a specific example, uh, one that I, I imagine this group is familiar with, and that involves FGFR2 fusions. Uh, which are present in about 20% of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. They involve uh, fusion of almost the entire FGFR2 uh, gene to a, a, a C-terminal binding partner that creates an abnormal constitutionally activated FGFR2. And uh, what, what uh, uh, many investigators in the room have shown is that uh, with, by inhibiting FGFR, specifically in these patients, uh, you can get very favorable responses in a certain percentage. Now, on the very uh, first uh, trial that we opened at, at MGH, we, we uh, with our team, decided to, to follow these patients with liquid biopsy. And this is what we found uh, uh, on, on one of the first patients that we studied. If you look in black, this is a mutation present in the, in the original tumor cell of this patient. You see it drops by about 90% uh, after the first few weeks of therapy, but then unfortunately rapidly starts to rise. But what we noticed was that this eventual rise in recurrence was accompanied by the emergence of five uh, uh, distinct uh, resistance mutations within the kinase domain of FGFR2. And as soon as I remember reviewing this report with the team, and as soon as we saw this, because we were able to view multiple uh, uh, modes of resistance in a patient, we knew that if this patient was finding, this patient's tumor was finding five different ways to reactivate FGFR, that this was likely to be one of the main mechanisms of resistance, and that certainly has led to be the case. But more importantly, um, the work of, of, of many folks has led to actually characterizing these alterations and finding that um, uh, each of these mutations drives resistance in a slightly different way. And while, it, while some of them may create resistance to one drug, in almost every case there's a different drug that can actually overcome that specific mutation. And this is really where I think liquid biopsy offers us the potential to rapidly adapt treatment uh, to prolong the benefit for patients. And so this is a really very interesting patient of, of Lipigogoyal who um, had actually a, a very good uh, over a year response to an initial FGFR inhibitor, uh, but unfortunately developed the emergence of an FGFR uh, K659M mutation, something that we see quite commonly in these patients. But because of this modeling, we were able to actually uh, uh, put this patient on another trial, and Lipica was able to treat this patient with a second inhibitor that, our, that preclinical data suggest overcame this alteration. And this patient actually went on to be on this second inhibitor longer than they were on the original inhibitor uh, for well over a year. And, and, and you can see that that specific resistance mechanism never came back. And I think this is where, really where we are in the field right now, where we can actually use this information in real time to benefit our patients. 
And so my last two slides, I just want to illustrate what I think will be one of the most exciting uh, emerging um, um, uh, 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 applications of liquid biopsy, and that is, again, we want to focus less on prolonging survival, but really more on how we can cure people. And right now, the only way we really can cure people is by taking out a tumor surgically. But we have no way of knowing who's actually cured or who actually not. And this, what this leads to is a painful period of waiting, sometimes for years. And I, I'm sure many of the people in this room know what that's like. But what we're trying to do now is to actually use circulating tumor needed to tell us, even a month after surgery, whether that patient still has detectable traces of cancer cells, even if we can't see them or not. And what this will allow us to do is if, if, if after a, a surgery, only a portion of patients shown in red might still have disease and ultimately will progress, if we actually sequence this tumor, identify a number of molecular alterations that provide us essentially a molecular fingerprint of that specific cancer, we can use that information to interrogate blood a few weeks after surgery at high depth and identify those patients who have no evidence of disease shown on top or patients who have trace amounts of circulating tumor DNA, which provides direct evidence that there's cancer somewhere in the body. And by focusing on these patients, we can really actually then provide additional therapy and actually bring some of our more innovative targeted therapies and immunotherapies perhaps into this early disease setting to not just get a few more months of progression-free survival, but to actually cure the tumor once and for all at this point. So to conclude, liquid biopsy can accurately track tumor burden throughout therapy, can identify multiple heterogeneous resistance alterations emerging on, upon resistance, and it can provide real-time insight into response to resistance, can, actually can may help, help us adapt therapy uh, for our patients. And I think that, that circulating tumor aid to identify patients with residual disease after surgery um, will really, uh, I think, increase our ability to salvage cure and to, and to really start to conduct clinical trials, not just in the metastatic setting, but in this all-important uh, early disease setting as well. And overall, integrating this uh, important approach into clinical trials will be important. A lot of people contributed to this work, our patients and our families, of course, uh, colleagues at MGH and other centers uh, and our funding sources. Uh, thanks again so much for having me. Um, uh, appreciate being here. <laughs>